Hello there, you're watching the press preview, our first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. Over the next half an hour, we're going to be talking through the headlines with the Daily Mirror columnist Susie Boniface and the Conservative commentator Tim Montgomery. So a very good evening to both of you. Nice to see you both. So to those front pages then, and the Eye claims to have exclusive details of the government's plan to get the UK out of lockdown due to be announced the week after next. But not to be outdone, the Mirror carries similar details, including that social mixing could be allowed again by May. The Sun seems to be even more optimistic. They say the pubs could be back open by April, though I see the words outdoor beers there at the bottom. Uh, the Daily Mail celebrates the likelihood of reaching the goal to vaccinate 15 million elderly and vulnerable people by Monday. The headline is, that's a jab well done. The Daily Express ties the two stories together, suggesting the reason lockdown might be able to be eased is partly because the vaccine rollout has been so rapid. Though, according to The Guardian, there are worries that people under 65 who have underlying conditions may not have been correctly classified and may not be called when it's their turn. The Daily Telegraph speaks to the Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, who says the aim is to make COVID become manageable on a year-to-year -year basis, much like the flu. The Times has seen government projections which estimate that the number of people in hospital with the virus is likely to halve or more within the next month. And the Financial Times reports that in the first phase of the pandemic last year, the UK economy sunk to its worst state in 300 years, but has now outpaced expectations with its recovery. And the Star condemns a postman who it alleges refused to help an elderly woman who'd fallen on his route because he was too tired. So, Susie Boniface and Tim Montgomery uh, here with me to tiptoe through those uh, front pages. Um, Susie, you've picked out the Times first of all. There's a lot of looking into the future in the papers, isn't there? And a certain amount of, of uh, projection and perhaps speculation. But the Times is focusing on what they say uh, is internal government projections about hospitalisation. So what are they saying here? Yep, they're saying there's going to be a fall in COVID patients because the R number has fallen below one. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm probably going to get tweeted by a load of Sky viewers after this about how gloomy and what a killjoy I'm being because there's so much good news as has been presented in the papers today about great news about jabs, great news about the COVID rate falling, great news about maybe the end of lockdown. But it, it, some of it is, is, is doing my head in, because in this Times piece about how the numbers are falling, it also points out that this is the first time the R rate has been below one since July. And that means that a, a killer disease has been circulating uh, and multiplying and out of our control for seven months. Nothing is good news when that has been happening. Yes, it's great there are some, some falls in COVID patients now and the numbers in hospitals are coming down, but the numbers in hospitals were so critically appalling that it, you know, an intensive care nurse was having to look after three patients at a time instead of one, and that means none of those three patients are getting truly intensive care. They're getting one-third of intensive care. Uh, and the intensive care nurses are doing 12-and-a-half-hour shifts. Um, it's just... Nothing about this is good news, I'm afraid. Um, it, it, it's good to some extent, but only because what it was was so appallingly awful. Well, yes, I mean, so, yes, it does. So, uh, do, do you take that point, Tim, that we are starting from a, a pretty appalling standpoint when we look about uh, things improving, but nevertheless, um, it is promising that uh, hospital numbers do look like they're heading the right direction from a very high point, as, as Susie is making clear there. <laughs> Absolutely. Susie does not have to wait until Twitter. She comes off this programme to Twitter to have someone uh, disagreeing with her. Look, of course, what we've been through as a nation, um, the NHS frontline staff, they've suffered enormously. And, you know, we all admire what they've done. We all grieve with the families who've lost um, loved ones. But my goodness, we need some good news. You know, we've all been in lockdown for nearly two months now. We want to believe that the sacrifices that we're all making have been worth it. And we have these stories in The Times, in the Mail, which show that we are getting on top of this virus at last. We have to be cautious because I think we feel we've been here before and the virus has, has returned. But it's good 
that um, infection rates are really beginning to come down, largely because of the impact of the lockdown rather than the vaccine. But then we have the effect of the vaccine that hopefully should start coming through as well. We're two days ahead of the government's target of uh, vaccinating all the key um, older vulnerable groups. And that's something really to celebrate. There's something, there's so many things that have gone wrong during this lockdown, but this vaccine rollout, the creation of the vaccines themselves, this is good news. And so Susie, um, un understandably, um, you know, is concerned about all the things that have gone wrong, but we need hope, we need light at the end of the tunnel. And these newspaper reports suggest that there is real light to look forward to. And so those headlines in the Times and the Mail, what we saw just there about hospital cases coming down and the, the uh, success so far of the vaccination programme, Susie, are inevitably going to prompt speculation about when uh, the lockdown restrictions may be eased. We're told we're going to get this roadmap from the Prime Minister a week on Monday. Um, the, the Mirror and some of the other papers already trying to look ahead to what might be announced. So what's the mirror telling us? They've got the uh, cheeky headline there, The Joy of Six, part two, they say. Yeah, there's a lot of cheeky headlines knocking around. Um, we could also do, with optimism as well, some accuracy and um, some realism. Uh, the vaccines that have been brilliant to have had them so far for the 15 or so million people who've had the first ones already. That's fantastic. And that means they've got some protection. But those vaccines aren't completed until they've had two doses. And in the next few months, all the people who've had one dose, and there's 14 and a half million so far who haven't had their second doses, they're going to have to start getting the second doses, which means our vaccination rate is going to shelve off slightly from the exponentially brilliant rate it's been up till now. So our rate of vaccination and protection of our population is going to steady a little bit. Um, and we're talking about the lifting of lockdown, but what they're actually talking about here is this is the, the roadmap out of the lockdown, which Boris Johnson's promised by February the 22nd. Two days ago, he told the BBC uh, at a public press conference that was televised that he wasn't going to reveal details about it. Now it appears in several of the newspapers, his office has been briefing out details of it, which means it hasn't gone through Parliament and it's not being publicly admitted that this is the plan, but yet we're letting it be heard 10 days before we're going to publish it. This is the sort of thing we're looking at. That's not helpful or beneficial, well, particularly. I'm not sure if we know exactly where it's come from. Certainly the, the Daily Mirror is quoting um, Professor Neil Ferguson uh, for s some of the, the reason that they're talking about uh, the, the lifting of restrictions in the way that they have. Though I should say tonight that uh, government sources are saying that no decisions have been made, they don't recognise these reports. But, Tim, there are a number of them, aren't there? The Sun, as well, is, is talking about pubs possibly opening in two months for outdoor uh, beers and food. Um, and I think the Eye, as well, is talking about what might happen. What do you make of this? I mean, all the messages we seem to be getting from the government at the moment is we're not going to give you details, we're going to take it very cautiously. So do you think that these, these papers are on the right track or not? I think what is happening across government, there's, there's only real one big sort of for, area of unity in government, and that's that schools must be the priority. I'm sure any parents watching who've been homeschooling their kids over the last few weeks will be uh, glad to hear that. Other than that, I think there's still quite a lot of active discussion in government about how quickly and what sort of parts of the economy reopen when. And I suspect what some of the newspapers are picking up from their various sources, ministerial and others inside government, are fragments of those um, discussions. But I think it's very premature uh, for us to look at any of these stories and bank on them being true. I think the government still wants to make further progress and we don't want any slip up in the vaccination rollout. And so I would urge any readers to read, for example, the Sun's front page tomorrow about pubs reopening and not be too excited too quickly and you know, okay. keep caution about exactly what's next. OK, and, and the Daily Telegraph looks ahead in a different kind of way, don't they, um, Susie? They're quoting the Health Secretary talking about how in the future he hopes that the country will be able to deal with coronavirus. Which is one of the dumbest interviews I think I've ever read, and I've read a lot of them. Um, he's entitled to his opinion, of course. And yes, it's possible in this country that uh, we would have the health service and the wealth and the access to vaccines that COVID doesn't need to affect us too much. But in the years to come, 
uh, you know, we may be well vaccinated, but the rest of the world will not be. Uh, Africa, for example, which has, I think, eight of the 15 fastest developing economies in the world, with which we need to do business in the years to come, is uh, so far has only vaccinated uh, 0.06% of its 1.3 billion population. Okay. And we need our trading partners to be healthy. Okay. If we're going to trade with them and our economy is going to be protected, never mind the moral imperative. We sorry need to, to vaccinate. Sorry to dive the in, Susie. I just want to give uh, Tim a chance to come back and we really ought to be going to a break. But, Tim, what's your take on that? Well, um, I, I think um, Susie's a bit harsh on Matt Hancock. But what is absolutely true is that we do need to help the rest of the world um, be vaccinated as well. And I'm glad that the government has contributed, I think, a billion pounds to the international vaccination programme. And we have to realise that we have to keep committing to that. This is a not a project that's going to be over in a year. We have to use our aid budget and our other resources as a country to be not to just be generous, but to show the solidarity we need with poorer nations so that we are all healthy in this era where COVID isn't going to go away. OK, and the, and the debate at which that help might start is, is going to go on as well, isn't it? Um, we're going to take a break right now. Um, coming up, though, don't go anywhere. Uh, we're going to talk about the outlook for the economy after the pandemic and whether it's right to increase taxes. We're going to be talking about that next. should protect our heritage. Unfortunately, it will become part of Azerbaijan. This monastery is under the protection for now, the next five years at least, of Russian peacekeepers. I'm Diana Magne and I'm Sky's Russia correspondent, based here in Moscow. I witnessed the despair of the Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh who were digging up the soil of their dead relatives. It's Armenians who've abandoned these villages now. Quite what their strategy is, I'm not sure, but they have made some arrests already today. They can't kill everyone, they can't shoot everyone, they, they can't arrest everybody. We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. I mean, this clearly says, I love Hitler. Are you saying that doesn't say Hitler? Russia insists that its military build-up in the Arctic is purely defensive.
welcome back. You're watching the press preview. With me tonight, Susie Boniface and Tim Montgomery. Um, and we're turning to the front of the FT next, Tim, aren't we? And um, today, some fairly grisly growth figures came out uh, showing uh, the, the kind of shrinkage to the economy last year um, as a result of the pandemic. A 300-year low, says the FT. They were, they were fairly grim figures, weren't they? Yeah, there's no, you know, hiding from the fact that the economic impact on the UK economy, despite the fact that the government has thrown everything, including the kitchen sink with its furlough programme and other measures to try and keep, you know, us all uh, employed and uh, the economic you know, output continuing as much as possible. But, you know, we have had as a country one of the steepest declines of, of any economy. I think that's partly because of the extent of some of the early problems that the government had in handling the crisis. But I think there are other reasons as well. Britain is a particularly open economy. Uh, London has been particularly badly hit by the economy. Uh, city and services have suffered. And so, yeah, there's a long way to go to, uh, I think, pick up the pieces from where the economy has been, let alone the educational impact and the other downsides of the COVID crisis. Well, yeah, and Susie, there will be a lot of businesses that have gone under or feel horribly mortally wounded by, by what's going on. But there is a hope that there'll be some kind of bounce back if and when we return to, 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 norma to normality. There, there are hopes for the future, aren't there? There are. I'm not quite sure what they're founded upon. Rishi Sunak in this piece uh, is quoted as being cautiously optimistic about the future. Uh, the Mail today was reporting that we're going to spend, 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 although one in four of us are struggling to make ends meet, according to the same newspaper. Um, I don't know why Sunak's cautiously optimistic, because, uh, you know, if you have been on an aeroplane and an engine fell off, and then the pilot comes out and announces he's stuck it back on with sticky tape and it'll be fine. He's cautiously optimistic we should take off now. You would say, no, no, that would be a terrible idea. The reason that Britain has had such a terrible economic impact from coronavirus is due to the way, as Tim said, the government handled coronavirus. The reason we still have had lockdowns, the reason they have been so long and so damaging is because they were so late. And that is why we have the economic impact we have with people like in Greater Manchester who've been locked down for a year, not two months, where the publicans are going under. Um, and if we, these are the people who crashed the bus, you know, to mix my metaphors, why would you trust them to keep on driving the bus? And okay. that's not a political point. That's just a, that's just a practical point. If someone has crashed your bus, you wouldn't okay. let them drive you on to destination, would you? you? You'd change the bus driver at least, if not the bus. Okay, very quick, very quick comeback on that, Tim. So it's relentlessly negative on every topic this evening. But look, the government have got some things wrong. <laughs> uh, the government have got some things wrong, and I would acknowledge them. I have in this programme. But on the vaccination programme, on help for people through things like the fur furlough scheme, the success of universal credit during this period, the, the government have got many things right as well. And governments all over the world, breaking news for Susie, have got things wrong as well. Well, that is 10% of the working population of this country have had not a single penny of help from the government. I, I'm one of them, Susie. Yeah. I fell in the cracks as well, but we have to acknowledge the bigger okay. picture. 10% okay. of people is a crack. We're going we're gonna to continue this conversation um, at 11.30, but we <laughs> are out of time now. Uh, Susie and Tim, always good to see you both and uh, see you again very shortly. Thank you.